Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Boje and welcome to my channel and thank you for tuning in to before we start, can you share the links to your friends and family who you think will find this webinar quite useful because there's going to be a lot of information that's going to be shared by Dr. Hussein. And as usual, before we start, I'll give him the opportunity to introduce himself. And before that, I want to give the purpose of this um, webinar. I know um, we all know that Africans and uh, minority groups have a lot of talent. Unfortunately, it's a bit difficult for them to get into grad school. And the major issue is actually due to lack of information. So I spoke to Dr. Hissin and we actually have the same goals to ensure that a lot of minority groups get um, the chance to make it up to continue the education and to also better their lives. And as a professor, he realized that most of the time they are major mistakes most people make and this prevents them from getting the opportunity they deserve so in today's webinar we are going to talk about the common mistakes and prospective graduates do when they are applying to us abroad or also even when contacting and professors and this is how it's going to go like after he introduced himself he's going to start with his presentation and from then i'm going to ask him a few questions and during the webinar if you have any questions just leave it in the comment section i'm going to bring it up and we are going to discuss it thank you and kindly share with your friends so dr he said could you start by introducing yourself, then we could get right into the conversation. Thank you, Barbara, uh, for, first of all, for the initiative itself, uh, having such a channel that enlightens our youth, the African uh, youth, African talents. Uh, I will talk later on about, there is an initiative here in Canada that's called the next Einstein should be from Africa. <laughs> So we have a lot of talents and thank you for having this initiative that uh, allows those talents to find pathways to graduate schools. Uh, my name is Usman Isin. Uh, I did my PhD uh, in the same university where Barbara is now doing her work at Sherbrooke University. Uh, 2019, I finished my PhD, then moved to Laval University for postdoc. My work is on uh, semi concrete research with focus on uh, multi scale design of cement tissues composed for uh, resilience and infrastructure sustainability. Uh, currently, I'm working as assistant professor at McMaster University. I started uh, a couple of months ago. That's all. So, today we'll be talking about common mistakes. Uh, graduate students commit when applying to graduate school and when contacting potential professors for the uh, potential funding opportunities. So what I will be talking to you about is a compilation of 88 graduate school chair responses to a survey. A survey was conducted and 88 graduate school chair confirmed that the most detrimental mistakes committed by graduate applicants, they call them cases of death, K-O-D. So I will go through those five biggest mistakes and will, with some highlights which are more aligned or streamlined to our uh, talents as black talents applying for graduate schools. So one of them is the you can see here that all the five have been highlighted here, and then we'll go through each one of those. Uh, they call them the KODs, the cases of death. So the first one is damaging personal statement, the essay. Most of the graduate schools, they ask you to write a research statement or a personal statement or a motivational statement. All of these refer to the same, this, to the same document. So the way you write this document is significantly important. We will go through details. And harmful letters of recommendations. Never think that the letter of recommendations are just fillers to fill your, your application package. No, they do serve a specific task in the application package. We'll detail those later. So the third one is lack of institutional program and even professional information. Not having enough information about the institution the department and the professor you are asking uh, potential supervision from, 
all of this could lead to KODs. Poor writing skills, which will be reflected in your personal essay. And also when contacting your professors, every single email you send to your professor, it should be written well, uh, not only your SOPs, a statement of purpose. And at the end, the misfired attempts to impress. Overlay flattery uh, will, not, will not serve you. So these, you could find them in detail in this article. I have ex extracted these from this article, Kisses of Death in the Graduate School Application Process, that was uh, prepared by uh, those co-authors from uh, Purdue University and Idaho State University. You can find the detailed uh, article there. So let us talk first of all about the damaging personal statements. Most of the time, and now as I'm already considering, uh, I've already uh, picked up a few applicants for my uh, research uh, unit. So I have received, I've, I've received several applications and it can simply confirm what has been written here about the damaging personal statements. Few applicants go to extra details about their personal. Yes, it is, it's called a personal statement, research statement, motivation, a statement of purpose. It could be it, but it should. I understand the tendency of applicants to go to the personal to the personal details because they want to personalize it because there are also other tips saying never keep your personal statement too general make it personal make it individual streamline it to your own cases i understand this but that tip should not drive us to the temptation to spray a lot of personal details this will be read by the graduate committee as miss or deficiency in the personal boundary between in, in the personal boundary in your life so in our life we have personal boundary that we could not dis divulge we could not dispatch all our personal details about so be careful about speaking a lot about your personal situations uh, as an example if somebody speaks about her his mental problems most probably will be rejected because in school graduate school there is significant significant uh, research uh, implication that requires your cognitive skills with you available all the time. So th this will usually lead to uh, like fatal, fa fa most of the time it will lead to rejections. That's based on the uh, survey that has been conducted in this study. Also, when providing your personal research statement, avoid avoid uh, bringing a lot of information about your previous, not information only, but in most of, in some of the cases, some applicants try to discredit their previous institution, previous institutions in a way to uh, bring some flattery, to praise the potential institution. So they try to criticize a bit the research environment or the lack of research infrastructure in their home countries or in their institution, and in a way to praise the potential applicant, the potential institution. This will not serve you because whoever discredits you in front of somebody here will discredit, or, or let me say in another way, as you are discrediting now your, your previous institution in front of the potential institution, you will be likely to discredit this potential institution to your potential employer or to potential up. Anyway, if you want to change your graduate school sometime, if you are, let us say you come here for a PhD for master's at institution X, and then after that, you want to go for PhD for institution Y, then since you have already discredited your former institution at home, back home country, you may be likely to discredit also the institution X when you are applying to institution Y. So avoid also harmful letter of recommendations. What we mean by this, ask recommendation letters from only those who know your work in very good detail and do not seek recommendation letters from family members. 
seeking recommendation letters from family members only tells the committee that you are unable to provide recommendation letters from those who know your technical depth. That's what that's only what it takes. It says. So even if your family member is the top-notch professor in the field, you have to get that info. You have to get the recommendation letter from elsewhere. Or if you get it from that family member top-notch in the field, then you have to avoid mentioning the, your relationship with that top-notch professor if he is your uncle or your aunt or mom or dad. Huh? You have to avoid mentioning the relationship between you so that the evaluation will be based only on your technical and credential depth. Also, I, I give you an example. Uh, last summer, a student of mine whom I taught 10 years ago in the United Arab Emirates contacted me. She was applying to a graduate school in the United States, and she's picking a couple of graduate schools that offer a specific program in architectural engineering, like a blend of architecture and engineering and design and like a lot of. So she, she picked a couple of schools that she knows what she wants. So though she hasn't been contacting me for the last 10 years, at the time she wanted to apply for that one, she found me, she found my emails from somewhere else. She knew I'm now at Sherbrooke. At that time I was in Sherbrooke. Yeah, last summer I was still in Laval. Yeah. She knew I was still in Laval. She picked my email and she reached, she reached to me. And why? Although during these 10 years, she had a lot of recommenders, uh, referees. She picked me because she knew I taught her engineering, structural engineering, when she was doing architectural engineering. So she knew that's the good person that will give her a recommendation letter that blends between architecture and engineering. Because these are two, two things. Architecture has to do with form, and engineering has to do with the function of the things, how the, how the materials, once you do put them in that fancy form that architectures want, how does it form engineeringly? How does it function engineeringly in terms of span to depth ratio, capacity? And I think if you are in engineering, few of you of the audience who are engineering understand what I'm talking about. Architects want very fancy, lengthy, wide spaced buildings, and engineers want a lot of columns to support all of those loads and so on. And there is continuous dilemma. So I, I, when the student contacted me, I was in a period where I'm preparing my move to, to McMaster. I was in a very terrible time of a lot of work, but I knew she was a very excellent student. So I took my time to write a very excellent letter of recommendation. I believe it was excellent because Later on, she contacted me and telling me that up, out of the five schools she applied to, she was admitted in four of them, and all are top schools. And she had four opportunities to apply to, to, to go to, because she got admitted with full scholarship to, five, to four out of five she applied to. What I'm trying to tell you from this story is that pick your recommenders the, the right way. Also, if your recommender did not ask you to submit a draft letter of recommendation, don't do that. What I mean, professors are very busy and sometimes, sometimes, not every time, they may tell you, send me a draft letter of recommendation of your work that I will edit and make it better. It happens because they are very busy. Why? Because they have a very general letter, letter of recommendation that they wrote to several students before you. And you are the one who know your work better than everyone else. So the, the professor may tell you, write a recommendation of your work, and then I will adjust it. If they tell you this, you could do. But if they don't tell you, don't like up, like, don't, don't go up front and make that draft letter. Why is it? Because in no way you can do a better letter of recommendation about your work compared to when your professor does it for you. Leave it to him, to her, to do it for you. She will do it in the best manner. And especially, just think of the of, the, of this, my story with my student. I was in a very like, tightened time, but when she threw it to me to do it for her, I did it for her, and she got it. OK, listen, um, I know like I wanted to ask the question like at the end, but I like, can I ask a question with regards to this topic. Yes, go. OK, because like it's it's like all over academic Twitter, the academic community, most people actually encourage people to 
draft a letter of recommendation letter for their professors. I, I, I hold the same view as you that I don't think as a student you should do that unless you are requested. But the issue also is the fact that most professors um, apparently, well, apparently, as you even you rightly said, that there's a draft where they use for other students. So students are scared that they are going to use the same draft. So it's like, let's say five people are applying to the same university and they ask the same professor and he has five, like it's basically the same letter, <laughs> but just different, like, okay, just change he or like, and I think that's a problem. So that's how come most people prefer to write a draft just to increase their chances. Because let's say you're a professor and you receive similar recommendation letters for five different students from the same university is automatic rejection. So, and like it's they paid done. application fee, they've done all these things. So with this, like, what can they do? Like for me, my undergrad, what my, I know my professors use a drug, but what they did was they did the drug based on statistics. So it's like they write um, the headings, maybe punctuality, ability to study, like the statistics that are needed. And they just click maybe top 5%, top 10%, top 15%. So even though it's the same draft, it's different for the individual because it's um, qu um, quantitative. So with this issue, what can they do? Mm -hmm. Because it's a really huge issue. Like, it's a really big issue. It if is. you send them to write a recommendation letter, it's a problem because, you know, well, I don't, but in Ghana, like, we have huge class sizes. So, like, just for my graduating class, we were, like, about 200. And let's and the student to professor ratio is not a lot to be like the same professor we ask and so this is a, a really major issue we are facing in africa so with this what can be done about that very good so you as a student you have the right to see your recommendation letter before it is sent so use that right so that the recommendation letter written by the professor is personalized to your personal circumstances. Okay. So once the professor writes the generic letter recommendation letter that we assume it's yeah. generic because 150, 200 students taught by one professor. So the professor does not literally have the time to write individualized recommendation letter for everybody. So that letter, you must have the ability to see it and by the way, this, the story I talked to you, though I wrote a very personalized recommendation letter to the student, I sent it to the student to see it and to adjust it, to further personalize it if she wants. And mm -hmm. she did further fine tuning. So what I'm trying to say is that let the professor write it at the first iteration, then bring it back to you to put some more personalized like data and while taking let, let's say you, you are 200 students in one class and then all the 200 students want to go for the for for an for a graduate application and all of them ask for a recommendation letter from one single professor x so what i recommend is that the professor writes a generic recommend because literally cannot write for everybody so a generic recommendation for everybody then send it to the 200 student every 200 student will write for example the professor will be writing during the last five years, I've been in contact with this student during the courses one, two, three, then those courses will be different from this student to the other one. Yeah. So Barbara will be saying that, okay, but the professor taught me one, two, three, four, five courses. And then in all of those courses, Barbara scored A, B, C, D, so, or A's in all of those courses. So those scores will not be the same for the 200 student anyway. And then when we go back, it's not only courses, there are extracurricular activities, there are the community involvement, and all of those would be differently different, definitely different for the 200 students. So courses, extracurricular involvements, uh, and all of those, put all of those together, and then it's in, on your hand to make your recommendation letter look personal once it comes from the professor a bit generic. Okay, I'm going to go a step further with this issue because this is a really huge issue we are facing. Excellent. Most professors actually will not give you the recommendation letter early. So sometimes it's they even put in the request maybe a day before your application. So that you don't even get a chance to even see it. 
to even make the correction, to be able to send it to them. Because as she said, you're busy. They are also busy. So we understand the fact that everybody's busy. So like you keep on reminding them, reminding them. Sometimes it's a day or two days before the recommendation and they just write and send it. And also like our ecosystem abroad and in Africa is a bit different. Like even asking the professor that unless you have, for me, I could because well, all my recommendation that I was sent to me for me to view because I mostly had the kind of relationship with the professors I requested from. But to ask your professor that, oh, I want to see the recommendation letter before you send it, and sometimes even as a student, sometimes it's a bit difficult for them to ask because we don't have that kind of rapport. It can be seen as disrespectful. And there's also mm -hmm. the issue of the timing in which it's sent. So in as much as I understand where you are coming from, sometimes it's also, it's the, the ecosystem is also a bit quite different. Okay, let me tell you this way. Yeah. Uh, the professors will be always willing to improve your chances. Okay. And transparency is very important. You need to explain or you have to reveal it very clearly to the professor that my chances will be very high only if my pers my recommendation letter is really like personal oriented. It's, it's really, it contains individual and personal detail. Having said this, you may ask your professors to have a look at your recommendation. When I was applying for my graduate studies, uh, when I was applying for my, my, my PhD, I was, I was in UAE. Uh, we, we still consider it as, 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 as a developing country, but I had the chance to see my recommendation letters before uh, moving for uh, grad studies. So in Africa, it's not different. I think once, anyway, the professors like, like your dad, your mom, they always want you to succeed. And for the sake of that success, anyone, anything else could be legitimate. They will allow you to see it if you just explain to them in detail that that I need to have this component, that personal component in it. Is there a possibility to see it? Just address it in a very polite manner. Don't let them understand that you are suspecting the way they write you. Yeah, just be be very be, be strategic. Be strategic, and by telling them that I just need to, to, to succeed in that that part. And is there a possibility to have a look at it? And uh, be, be strategic, and they will allow you. The other tip is that uh, give your recommender enough time. If you give them enough time, then there is time to maneuver. If you sub if you give them like three days earlier than the submission, then one day <laughs> beyond uh, uh, before the submission, they will finalize and send. So they, you will not have the time to look at your recommendation. So give them enough time. Explain to them that having some individualized component in your recommendation letter is very important. Let them know that you, if you had the chance to look at your recommendation letter before them and spread in it some personal component that will increase your chances, give it that, give them this point of view in a very polite manner, and you will be amazed the way they will respond to you. Okay, thank you. So I'll leave you to continue with it. Yes, <laughs> So let's go to the third one, lack of institutional program, professional information. I was reviewing my applicants and one of the things that made me like uh, laugh, one was writing, given your expertise in structural engineering and steel construction and machine learning, I have, I have never done steel structures in my research at all. So that student just copied that one from the, from the message she sent to to somebody else, and then she brought it back to me. So when your applicant does not really go into depth to look at what you do and brings to you a generic email and even a generic statement that literally has been copied from the, I, I'm not saying that that, mess, that that content has been copied from somebody else's work, but from her own work, but that was submitted elsewhere. This is about the personalization. Like your personal recommendation letter, that has to be personalized. Your emails that you send to the professor has to be really personalized in terms of your input and the professor's work. You get the point? One, 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 one of the emails I received was about praising an article of mine that was like, uh, that came out a couple of, uh, I think, a few months ago. Uh, that's the best article and I've seen. Uh, though I know myself that th that article is not the top-notch article in the field. I know. 
it's 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 I, I have better article than that during the last few years. I have better articles than that article the student was praising. So extra flatter is not good. Be strategic. So also you have to get information, very good information about your school. Never go to grad school or to, to never say even in your in your statements, in your emails some flattery about the ranking of the school or of the program because ranking is really like subjected to so many factors and it can go up and down and so on. So don't put a lot of accent on this. And when you do your research about the school, make sure that you are choosing the school because there is a significant and iconic research in the field you are selecting. You get the point. There are some professors who are the world leaders of their field, and they are in, I don't know, 300 uh, ranking universities. You get the point. So those professors, they are in low ranked universities, but they're doing the top notch research in their field. And they are the iconic leaders of their field. So there is nothing to do with the ranking of the university. If you go to those professors and work with them, they can you can you can put your 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 career in that field in a new line of progress and growth that would have been done if you go to a top notch school and a high ranking school where there are only uh, researchers who are not that very successful in their field. So you have to research your school very well, your program and the professors you are going to apply to. The fourth one is about the writing skills and that will be reflected directly on your personal statement and as well as in your emails. So the email you send your professor, you have to be careful because we as professors, we consider those graduate students as investment. Of course, it is a win-win investment. The graduate student comes and invests time and effort, and in some situations, even money, if he, if he she did not get full funding, so she can even spend money. So with this investment from the student, and also investment from the professor, because in so many situations, especially for PhD, we pay money, uh, and also we invest time of supervision, writing researches with them and articles and so on, and, and and one-to-one -one mentoring and those. So this, for this, professors are really uh, careful about whom they will select. You get the point. And when you have a new professor like me, I just started like uh, five months ago or even or like four months ago. So even we are even more careful about whom we select because the first student we select are the ones which will set the benchmark and the quality gauge of our research. If we start with low profile students, this will drag on to the rest. So what you need to do with this is that be careful to display the best of your writing skills in your personal statement, in the emails you do with your professors, and be brief. Three page research statement or personal statement is too long. If there is no guideline for one pager, so you can go to one and a half, two, that's fine. But while doing that, try to put the best and the most important information within the first page. We as human beings, we have been designed in such a way that the first impression matters. The first few lines we read matter a lot. So try to put the best information within the first page, even if the guideline says go for two pages or three pages. So I know African talents have very good writing skills, even if some of them in oral communication, uh, let us talk, let us talk frankly, because we are in house, we are in house, we are one family as African, talents and future researchers. Uh, oral communication versus written communication are two different things. And in research, we prefer both. But if we had the situation where 
I have to select between a person who has very good oral communication versus somebody who has excellent writing communication. I, good, I will go for the one who has excellent writing communication. I'm, I'm saying if I got, if I had to choose only one, but in the most of the cases, we want those who are good in both oral and written. So what my humble experience tells me is that Africans are very, very good in writing. They write very well. And I have seen a group of uh, Africans in, in the University of Alberta or somewhere else. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, sorry to mention the names. I think in, an, in a university somewhere in Canada. So that group of students, they challenged that, that university that students coming from a given country in Africa, they should not even need to bring TOEFL. This just tells that we Africans, especially those coming from English speaking universities, uh, countries, they have the right preparation. They got well prepared to undertake uh, graduate studies in English without the need for uh, TOEFL or English proficiency exams. This is just an example. So perfected well, don't submit essays that contain errors and typos. So having said about your, we as Africans, having talked about the excellent right to communications, so that should not also lead us to, uh, evolve, to, 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 uh, to, to cover our eyes from those typing errors and so those typing errors could happen even from established researchers because they happen due to the speed of writing and stress of work. So once you write your essay, have it proofread by your colleagues, by your professors, by somebody else. If you don't have somebody to read to you, send it to uh, perhaps uh, a proofreader. You can pay money for a proofreader for an hour to check it for you. You will not lose a lot of um, you will gain a lot of uh, you will gain a lot by having your essay proofread because this is the person this is the first communication writing writing communication between you and the graduate study and between you and the professor and the professor will 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 uh will project in the future okay with this writing skills this could be a good writer for the research for the articles for whatever so think of it that way the last one is what I highlighted previously, and I will go again about it. Avoid excessive attempts to impress by flattery, by providing flattery to the institution, and especially avoid criticizing your former institution. That's what I said in the, in the, in the past. If you criticize your former institution for lack of infrastructure and research, and that's why you are applying to this new institution to, re to, to conduct the research, that's not a good, that will not be viewed positively because it will be seen as a negative person who will even continue talking negatively about the same institution now to another institution in the future. This is in general. If you want to get more detail about what I have talked about, uh, look at the uh, article that I showed in the beginning. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, this article will give you a lot of details about the uh, those five KODs, the case of this. Uh, one further thing I would say about the African applicants to graduate studies, what, there is one thing. Nowadays, this is this is a factor. This is an element that appeared very recently. There is significant information and research that has been done, which shows that diversity brings excellence, brings more innovation within the research community or within the industry or whatever. And knowing that universities are the hub are the motor, the engine that generates the market leaders in the different fields. So having diversity in the universities, in the, in the, in the higher education institutions will most likely drive diversity also in the different sectors in the real life, in the industry. Having said this, there is significant move towards diversifying the higher education intake, especially at the graduate studies level in research, in the master's level, the PhD level, there is significant move now 
to diversify the student population. What does mean? What does that mean? Is that people who were historically underrepresented in graduate studies have now higher chances to be represented. That does not mean that we will be, that graduate in the graduate schools they will be selecting people from the underrepresented groups, which include uh, Africans, uh, indigenous people, women, and so on. All of these we call we they are considered underrepresented groups. But the move towards accepting or accepting higher intake of underrepresented students from underrepresented groups doesn't mean they will will they will select. Uh, only based on that factor. So the excellence criteria remains as it is. All students will be placed at the same at the same level of criteria, at the same level of criteria in terms of scrutiny, uh, academic ex excellence, and previous experience. If if needed, then the uh, diversity comes with that. So. Professors, researchers, uh, uh, and, and government institutions are also now aware of the importance of diversity. And in so many situations, researchers are asked to go through what we call the unconscious bias. What does that mean is that when I'm selecting applications from different applicants with different perspectives and backgrounds, how am I assessing them? Am I assessing them based on their credentials in front of me, or there is a something on the backbone that drives my selection? Is there are there any historical stereotypes which are at the backbone and driving me to deselect some people just just because they belong to some specific groups? So researchers now are aware of this, and government agencies are aware of this, and pushing researchers to continuously take unconscious bias tests so that we professors become critical to our own process of selection to guarantee that we have a diverse pool of applicants and students in our research environment. Having said that, so chances are higher now than previous than, than any time in the past. So do your homework in terms of preparation, craft your application in the best manner, Put in very compelling stories, personalized ones. Professors want people who write very strong stories because research is about a story. When you write an article, every article is a story. You have to craft strong story about what you do. Some of you may know about nature. Nature is one of the top research publication platform. And you cannot publish without putting a really compelling story about it will be maybe a few pages, very, very succinct, but has to be very compelling. And Africans are well known for stories. So use that. Since our early age, we used to listen to stories under the, under the moon, shine, light, and the stories continue uh, nights for, for a long time. So use those capabilities to write strong stories in your applications and use those as well when you do research. Thank you. And thank you very much. It's, 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 been a, it's been a great session. I really like all the things you mentioned because that's actually most of the things we keep on pushing people to do. So I like the fact that you've been able to validate all the information and we are sharing to people. So. Um, this is the question period. So if you have any questions, leave it in the comment section. I'll bring it up for us to discuss. Mm -hmm. But I personally have a question and it's about the storytelling and like the strong communication skills, the written communication mm -hmm. skills. I know that like um, there's been a lot of talk that to get into grad school, you need to have some papers, which you confirm not necessarily need to have some papers, but as you said, you always choose somebody with strong written skills. But this is a case where for our educational system back in Africa, we hardly write papers. So like for students who are applying from Africa who do not have any publications to their names, I know that now that there's a lot of information, people are trying as much as possible to learn these skills while seeing um, undergrad to be able to write and push to get papers. But the truth is not everybody will be able to do that. 
what are the other avenues people could use to show they have strong writing skills? For me personally, um, what I encourage people to do is, if it's possible to even write a short research proposal to show the professor that, oh, um, I could um, perform with, I might not have a paper, but these are some of my skill sets to show them how like their writing skills are like back for you what do you think about this and what are some of the avenues students can do to be able to show their writing skills because now as you said it's a global pool you are competing with people from all over the world what can we do when it comes to this regard very good very good so this is a very good question if you had applicants with X strong communications in, in writing and, and especially during the application period all what we know is writing sometime we conduct once we are impressed by the writing skills we go to the next step where we do uh zoom interviews to see their communication right uh, their, their oral communication skills but the writing is the gate and your question is important because how that writing uh, right how those writing skills can be can be like shown in a better way when when the uh, when in Africa we don't have the chance to participate in, in collaborate in research and, and writing articles. Your suggestion is bright. Look at the professor you are you're 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 contacting. Look her his research directions, and then suggest. A research proposal based on the research direction of that professor. Don't write any a generic research proposal. Barbara, assume Barbara is going to be a professor in one in two years. She finished her PhD. Barbara is working on semi concrete research. Look in the specific field of semi concrete research in that particular part, what she's trying to like work on during the coming few years, and then write. Right, and and the and today this year is now with the web open uh, web, you have a lot of access to everything you want, and you can write a very good research proposal. So you will not be evaluated as a experienced researcher and write research proposal, but just as a as a taste. Yeah, it, it gives an interest to the professor. Say that wow, this is this this is student is really pro motivated and an action driven so this is a very good suggestion the other thing is that nowadays after the, the post covid situation there are a lot of uh, there, there are a lot of conferences going online so i know moving to international conferences for in person is going to be demanding for we for for, for us in africa for so there are international conferences of, of highest scale, which are going still online. So try to do with your professors, any if, with any of your one of your professors, uh, join one of those conferences and write, write conference articles, conference articles. And graduate studies do not start, if, if you are applying to, for graduate studies tomorrow, then all of those tips will not work because you are you are very close to your deadline. But graduate studies is, is an investment. And since it's an investment, we prepare for it from day one in our undergrad. From day one, if I have an idea about going to graduate studies. So from that day, I start preparing myself, connecting with professors. Assume that at day one when you're undergrad, you are still not sure about where you go. But at least mid, 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 mid path, when you reach the second year or, or, or let us say third year for five year programs, you must be able to know. Uh, where we'll be uh, heading to and start to nesting and, and establishing connections with professors and and, and then this will enable you uh, picking one of those international conferences which are still online and, and submitting into, like uh, into conferences. So this will help you. However, the uh, uh, publications are not mandatory. For for master applicants, no one looks at publications for master applicants. This is forget about it because we don't do research at the undergrad. Okay, for PhD applicants, it is preferable. It's preferable, but if I got a, a recently graduated student 
with a very high GPA and very good pers like interpersonal skills and extracurricular activities. And I can see from the CV and from the research statement and personal statement that this student is very like diverse student who is like uh, all in one, I can say one stop shop. If I got this student, even if she does not have the publications, I would prefer this student versus another who finished her master's 10 years ago and had five articles. So within 10 years, it's normal that within 10 years, this person can make five articles. So that student who just graduated, who had, who, who does not have articles, if you give her 10 years, she could do 20 articles. So professors look at look at these things like this, and then so don't look at publications as as that like critically important. They are important, but not the only measure. And to compensate for the lack of publication, so consider what I have just said. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so my next question is um, for you personally. What are the things you look forward like? When people submit their documents, what do you look for? What do you look for to be like? Okay, I want to choose this, this, and this candidate for an interview. That's the first question, and the second question is in the interview stage. What do you look forward to choose your final candidates? Yeah, very good. Uh, usually, the first the first item I look is the CV. <laughs> uh, maybe this 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 uh, this strategy may not be the same for every professor, but that's my personal strategy. I first look at the CV. The CV tells me about the career gaps. When did she graduate? When did he graduate? And at which stage? So it tells me a lot which university uh, the student comes from. I usually pick the, uh, the, the student, the university name and try to see it if uh, it is among those universities which are known. I know all of you, our universities in Africa uh, are, are, are very good universities. I know the, the, the situation, maybe the, we don't have the infrastructure of research that enable them to be uh, at high level of research output, but still we have very good universities. I'm quite sure of that. So I usually look at the, the CV and personally in the CV, what I try to look is, uh, a student who just graduated is still highly motivated. So a new graduating student with extracurricular activity involvement and a very good research statement. After the CV, I, I go and look at the uh, research statement or a personal statement. And within the personal statement, the most thing that attracts me is the uh, involvement in extracurricular activities. This is very important. During the studies, most students consider the extracurricular activities as waste of time. They are not. They are not. And you will see them impacting your career a lot. If you are still at the undergrad, involved in extracurricular activities from tomorrow. It's very important. It shapes your career. Your it's, it's a lot important. If you have uh, student associations in your school, student unions, be part of those. These are the ones which propel your communication, your leadership, and that these are very important. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is during the interview, what, so now okay. it gets them into the door. So during the interview, what do you look at? Very good. During the interview, yes. Once I select among those, I select the, the student uh that goes to the next stage because the first stage is screening the applicants and finding the right ones from the cv the personal statement and so on the next stage comes to uh in online meeting so in the online meeting is is, is mainly to confirm what is written in the cv if the person says she knows he knows about alkali activated materials then she must demonstrate the ability, the ability, the ability to talk about alkali activated materials. So don't, don't just write in your CV and your research statement items related to the professor because you want to impress the professor. No, write things which you 
if if you are writing items in your in your documents about the prof potential work that the professor is doing don't put them as your expertise but put them as your research interest you are interested in those but don't write that you are a skilled highly skilled in those if you say this then you will be quiz you will be put in a quiz during the <laughs> online meeting so don't write what you don't really manage so this is the in, during the online interview i asked about what is written in the cv and also while the student is speaking about this i'm assessing the interpersonal relationship the ability to speak fluently and without relying because if a person speaks to you online and reading from another screen it's known you can know very easily if the person is reading from a screen or talking to you directly i have i have met some people who while i'm asking them they were reading from another screen and it's easy to capture that it's not hard okay okay uh, thank you so um as i said like this is the time for questions so if you have any questions and uh, leave it in the comment section. So my next question, it's uh, short courses. How are they important and how do they impact your selection of a student? Like these online short courses on Coursera, Stanford, and how are they important in choosing mm -hmm. a candidate? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, I see a lot of uh, comments on the uh, chat, but I think those are not, co not no questions, right? No, no, they are just comments, yeah. No questions yet, yeah. Feel free, I'm, I'm talking, I'm addressing now to the audience. Feel free to ask any question you have. So the, the few minutes left are for you. Okay, I'm back to Barbara, yeah. Go ahead, Barbara. Um, how are the short courses or webinars people take important in your selection process of a student? Okay, are you, are you saying how the webinar and short courses online, for example, courses, which yeah. we take in a specific field, how do they influence our chances for assets? For, for exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, these are very important, especially those courses which come from uh, accredited institutions. Okay. Uh, uh, if, uh, if you take short courses uh, in a specific field, uh, Look, nowadays, post-COVID uh, era now, everything, most of the things are run online. And online, we can learn a lot of things. So definitely, if you uh, highlight in your CV a blend of uh, courses that you talk online from accredited institutions, they will definitely add up to your, uh, they will increase your chances for graduation. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. So uh, my next question is, uh, I'm going back to the CV. Does the structure of the CV matter or for you is just the information in the CV? Okay. So the information is important, but a carelessly structured CV will make us really angry. <laughs> yeah. When, when, when out of the busy schedule, you like allocate a couple of hours to look at the CVs, well-written documents, well-structured documents will like, de like, like depassivate, release some of your stresses of work. Yeah. When you, after all of, the, all of those uh, hectic work, when you end up having a very carelessly structured CV, uh, it usually reduces the chances for success. Okay, okay. Yeah. So there's a question here I'm going to bring on board. Okay, I saw here a question. Yeah. yeah. So does he expect students to ask him questions during... Yeah. Yes. Not necessary, but when the student is prepared to ask questions during the interview, it means the student is one level ahead and uh, capable of exchanging. The interview is not only for the professor to, to ask. It's not just one unidirectional speech. It is two directional speech, the interview. So the professor asks us, the student answers, but also the student asks us and the professor answers. So make it like uh, interlocutation process it should be from you two directions okay. but if the okay. student does not ask it's not a problem okay okay so
So Masood was here and uh, yeah. <laughs> Masood. Masood, I need to leave. Yeah. I must be this living, but I just came to say, to send my regards to Prophet. <laughs> Thank you, Masoud, for being here. And uh, we are glad. <laughs> yes, yeah, so my next question is it's you talk about the fact that if you plan on going to grad school, it's very important you prepare right from undergrad. How can one prepare for grad school? Because most of the time you haven't been there yet. So what are some of the things you can do to prepare for grad school? Yes. One, yeah. Um, okay, you didn't hear me. So like, you talked about the fact that it's very important to start your preparation for grad school right from undergrad. Yes. What are some of the things you can do during your undergrad studies to prepare you for grad school? Because most of the time, students have not already been there. So as a professor, how can students prepare for grad school right from the undergrad? Are there specific things they could do for that? Very good question. Uh, if we consider that the graduate, your graduate uh, admission is, uh, is a function of what we just said, your academic preparation, your extracurricular involvement, your communication skills, then you should invest from day one on those aspects. So when we start the undergrad studies the, i'm talking about the usual and normal conditions in normal conditions research says that students start the undergrad studies with the, at the highest level of motivation and then it is up to the institution and the environment to keep that motivation at that level or it drops so having said that it means that you, students start with high motivation that's very good so keep that motivation all the way up and with that grab together very good marks um when i teach courses uh, what i tell my students is that at the beginning of the course everyone is a it is up onto the student to maintain that a or go back to other marks so every course you take, consider that you are at that. And, and, that's, and that's true. All professors consider it the students when they start, they are at the top level. And then down the road, the assignments, the exams, and the whatever. So some of them will drop to some levels, but some of them will maintain that initial expectation. So for all courses you take, maintain the best marks. That's one thing. Involve in extracurricular activities to boost your communication, your leadership skills. And uh, take take extra courses, take extra classes, and involve and in, in any other opportunities available within your school to enhance your communication skills. Okay, thank you. There is a question here that I'm gonna put on. So, like to summarize it, uh, get good grades, take extra course, take extra courses, and take extra curricular activities. These are like exactly. some events. Yeah, yeah, I will add one thing. I will add one thing. Yeah. The communication skills can be enhanced significantly. I know at the age between 20 to 25, 18 to 20, 25, that's the age of undergrad students. Uh, along with the studies, many, they have other personal like uh, inquiries and, and and hobbies of uh, watching films and so on. Yeah. So if you're really curious about your, and, and you're really careful about your future, tune those films you follow to the specifics uh, in your field. For example, I, I know a student who loves documentaries and then at a time that student shifted from general documentaries to mega structures. So a documentary that's only that that talks about structures and buildings and, and so on, and you know the way the documentary films are structured. So it's very interesting, attractive. So at the same time, that student continues follow, following her interest. Interest, but also she's enriching her knowledge in her field while uh, grasping new 
backups new way of uh, information uh, dissipation and so on okay. so be prepared for those okay thanks so uh, the next question is Uh, the, can you see the question or I should read it? Uh, I don't, I don't, okay. We okay, so I'm going to read it. So can a professor exclusively pick a graduate student even when the admission board does not approve? Okay, yeah, I, I see it on the screen, yeah. Okay. I, I was looking at the chat, which okay, no, no, no. Oh, is which which okay. a lot. Okay, yeah. So yeah, I see now. Can a professor exclusively pick a graduate student even when the admission board does not approve? Oh. <laughs> this is this is an experience this is a question from somebody who looks to be experienced yes yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> because the, the person seems to have even apply i don't know so even mentioning that there is a board and there is a professor's power to select this says this person has an experience so let me tell you this way if the application is for fully full fund from the professor then the professor has the professor can the professor can ask the committee to review their selection process because at the end of the day it is the professor who will pay the money okay yeah so the committee will not reject and the committee who who, who are the committee the committee are the colleagues of the professor they are not coming from another planet so they are the colleague of the professor so the professor will simply tell them oh please i need this student so just go and revise your selection this one does not say that the professor can counteract the selection process when the student is even below the criteria. Okay, yeah, so that's my, actually my, my next question, okay. The student must, must exceed, must like cross the bar of the selection criteria. Okay. And then the professor can defend. Okay. Because the university has, and the, the board or with the committee, the committee is there to implement the university criteria. Okay to make sure that all those who are selected are at the level and this is for this for the benefit of everybody because we want to have an environment where all of those are very good in communication in writing interpersonal relationship and br brilliant student we don't want to have low profile students this is the process okay okay so the students first will have to meet the criteria then from there the professor has to say okay Thank yes. you. The professor can defend up to the <laughs> to the last <laughs> birth. Okay. Um, so Randy, I hope you had your answer. So my next, the next question is. Okay, does does okay that that's research experience in my undergrad studies in admission like master research. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, you the student is asking if she can get admitted at McMaster, specifically when she doesn't have uh, research experience. Exactly, yeah. Uh, is she applying for, for a master's or PhD? Uh, master's by research, so master's. OK. We do not expect, we do not expect for master applicants to have uh, research experience. Although I'm not speaking today on behalf of the School of Admission, of Graduate Mission at McMaster. I'm not speaking on their behalf. I'm just speaking on my personal name as a professor. So as a professor, I do not expect master students to, to uh, have research. But if I got a master student who got research, which means that th that student did research at the undergrad, which is really very rare, very okay. rare. Yeah, very rare. So we do not expect in general. OK, um, um, to piggyback on this question, I think it's important we like we when you say research experience, what do you have in mind? Because I feel a lot of there's a lot of miscommunication on what research experience is. And a lot of people have this huge like what is a research experience? For me personally, I not for me personally, okay. Personally, mm -hmm. I feel that having research experience, like even writing your undergraduate thesis, like most of us did write undergraduate thesis, and for me. I think that could count as research experience. So could you explain to us when you say research experience, what very does good, it, what does it and what can you do to show that you have research experience? Because I feel that people feel is this 
strange or huge thing. So can we uh, mm -hmm. demystify what research experience? So very good question. We have to differentiate between research experience and research potential. Mm -hmm. So research experience, most of the time, need to be demonstrated by an output. So that output, if you did the undergrad, the undergrad uh, senior design project or capstone project is, is more of a design, not as a research. But if you really did a research and the undergrad that ended up to be to, to have a report out of that, then that report is form of, of production. So it can be considered as a research experience. Nowadays, few universities have undergrad research uh, and which can end up in publication or a report that's good enough to be an output, okay? But research potential can be, if you did an undergrad summer intern in a research, uh, research lab, during my PhD, I received several, I, I received several, uh, I received several undergrad trainees during my, while I was doing my PhD. So those trainees, involved in research and they they and they conduct a lot of like experimental work that the main uh, grad students are doing so this is a research experience you get the point having exposure to the research environment itself is is, is a good uh, potential it's an indication so all what's needed here is an indication so take it as uh, as one like message take home message is that we mainly expect few publications from students who apply for PhD, but applicants to masters, we do not expect. We do not expect publications. Okay. And if those applicants had prior research exposure, that will add up, that will add to their uh, credentials. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is, Let me read for you uh, one comment that Masoud has mentioned okay. here. Uh, I give one advice: make strong your CV, publications, and your language proficiency. Postgrad is not a job; it's an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Masoud. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is a very good advice. From day one of your undergrad, start crafting a very good CV. And what you culminate from day one will show later on. Will show later on. And uh, yeah, your, your CV, as a str the strongest you make it, the better chances you have. Yes. I didn't know you could read the questions directly, so I prefer to tell you. Okay. How important is our transcript to the selection process? Yeah. So this is this is this has been the, the message, the previous message and advice from from Masoud could also highlight has highlighted indirectly this. The transcript is the most important part because at the onset of the selection process, we have no idea about the applicant. We are only speaking with marks at the beginning. Then, so. When, you, when, I, when we look at the CV and we see uh, the chronology of, uh, of, of the academic path and the grades, why the CV in the beginning? Because in the CV, most of the students will write uh, bachelor's CV or uh, GPA of this, and then master's GPA of this. Usually this will drive us to go to, this, to the transcript at the second stage or the third stage to look in the transcript. A transcript that has uh, failed marks is really a red flag. Yeah, if there are failed courses, is usually a red flag. Although there, are, if 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 there is a situation where a student had failed some courses due to some specific circumstances, we are human. We may have specific circumstances, uh, illness, death of uh, relatives, and so on. Then you must be able to provide justification of that. Be ready to justify this, and don't leave it unjustified to the professor to discover it. And then the professor starts thinking, what happened to this? So though at the research and in grad studies, the grad studies is, is research oriented. There is no lot of uh, courses, but still failing courses just tells us that there is 
uh, deficiency in the persistence because we need in research people who once embark in a, 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 any venture, they can persist resiliently until the end. When a course is only four months here in North America or eight months in, in Africa, if you have long courses. So if you cannot resiliently sustain one course for four months from beginning to end to succeed, then people who are reviewing your work will say, perhaps this person cannot resiliently sustain the research I'm giving to uh, to take it from a, from a to z so make sure that you got a very decent transcript your trans th this means again that from day one you have to perfect your transcripts okay thank you so the next question is what are some of the phd questions that could be asked is this for the in online interview yeah i think it's for the online interview i can tell you most of the professors will tell you from the beginning tell us about yourself so yeah. you have to be able to tell about yourself uh fluently yeah. uh, i've received cvs with very high like uh publications and so on and uh, when speaking directly they cannot speak so this is also Although this is not, this is not like the sim, the, the 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 only one detrimental problem, but it's all not a good sign also. So be able to speak about their CV. So like oral CV, that's the meaning of the first question. Speak about yourself. So you should be able to orally speak about your CV, and whatever you have written in your CV, you have to be prepared to talk about. So the professor will definitely ask you about some field question. So. I had a friend of mine who does, uh, who whose research is very intense in machine learning, and that professor will even give the student uh, a code, a Python code, a Python code to uh, fix it uh, with, with errors to fix it or, or to write a Python code right away on the email. And uh, if we have any sus suspicion, if we suspect that the student is not well versed in writing on the online we may ask the student to take like 15 minutes or 30 minutes while we are still online to write about the topic okay it's possible also. okay yeah. and yeah. thanks for even bringing it up like i've actually made a video on some of the questions students will be asked during the interview and how to answer it and i think it will go live on November 18th. So um, check it out. Like if you haven't yet subscribed, do so and hit the bell button so that when it goes live, you could use that as a preparation. So the next question will be, yeah. Sir, you say the fresh graduate is often highly motivated and perhaps may be granted an interview before other graduates. This is not a fully a full statement of what I've said. Yeah. I have said a fresh graduate with high marks, excellent communication skills, and, 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 and community and extracurricular involvement is, has higher chances for admission than uh, an old somebody who graduated several years ago who has a lot of research, even if the undergrad, even if the new graduate student does not have, the fresh one does not have uh, publication. So the I was trying to put the accent on the how the publication how is it important or not. So it's it is a stage related stuff. Okay. So thank, thanks for clarifying this. So the next question is. Okay, my hinder our time to potentially to, to engage in extra activities do African global universities regard NYCS. What is NYSCC? SC? Okay, so it's, it's, it's a system in Nigeria and Ghana which we serve our nation after we are done with our undergraduate studies. So it's like a comp, it's, it's a compulsory one year service to the nation. Mm -hmm. Which so and I, for me pers I, pers I don't know why I keep on saying for me personally, but um, personally I believe that's actually a great avenue for individuals to gain. Um, Doctor Hisen, are you there? Can you hear me? I I can hear you. Okay, okay. So it, it's a period for people to gain enhanced um, uh, enhanced experience. So once you are done with your undergraduate, you have to serve your nation for one year. So people are posted to 
companies, people stay in the university to work. So I, I, was, I stayed in my university after I was done with my undergrad for one year. Why I served as the personal okay. and research assistant to the okay, program. Okay, okay, yeah. In that case, I think the, the term extracurricular activity is not well understood then. Okay, yes. Yeah. This, this, this NYSC then becomes part of the extracurricular activity. Yeah. If you finish your school and then go to serving the nation for this time, during that time, you're not sleeping. You are serving your nation and doing a lot of work that are not related to your technical domain. Yeah. So you have to record this one as part of your achievements. Exactly. Because even for me in my TV, that's actually part of my teaching and research experience. Because when I said I actually perform these activities, so that's that is under that in my I, I feel it's actually a great opportunity for people to get because some people are also posted in their fields so and civil engineers are posted in civil engineering firms. So you get to practice that. So I don't see I probably maybe I don't understand the question. So Ubo Chuku, could you explain like the problem you have with the NYSC? Because I think it's actually a great opportunity for it people is, to is. find new interests and to do so many things. So maybe you could ask your question mm -hmm. another way. Maybe we are not getting exactly the message you are trying to put across. So I'll go to the next question. Uh, just a comment for the previous question. Uh, yeah. During my yeah, like teenage, uh, I, I was part of scooting. You know scooting? Scooting? No? Yeah. Like scooter or, or no, scouting? No, no, no. Uh, I don't know what you call that. But... Okay. But what do you do maybe when you say that I might understand? No, no. Scooters. Scooters are usually those uh, young kids where they look like police usually and they go to camping for... Oh, yeah, scouts. So scouts. Scouts. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. I, I went for, for around uh, around like two years I was, I was part of it. Okay, and, and 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 that one is part of uh, it, it helped me to build a lot of uh, a lot of skills in terms of personal interpersonal skills dependence self dependence and so on and uh, I used to highlight that one when I applied to when I was applying to any uh, up to any opportunities I used to apply to uh, mention that one yeah that's great. So, okay, what is the next question? Okay. Why do some schools ask applicants to list the name of the other schools they are applying to in the era? Yes. Okay. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm not to speaking on behalf of the graduate school. So I'm not uh, able to answer this question because this question will be better answered by the graduate school committee who asks this question. Okay. But as a professor, I'm not aware why this question is asked. Okay, so I, I have a personal question. Is code emailing important and should do you advise students okay. who do that like to email professors before they apply to the school? Yeah, uh, especially because when you apply for a PhD, you always need to mention your potential supervisor. Yeah. yeah. And then without communicating with the professor early on, you cannot mention her name or his name. So in this case, that email becomes even mandatory for the PhD. Okay. You have to communicate with the professor for your uh, willingness to mention his, her name in, as, as a potential supervisor. Okay. Thank you. And the next question is: Is it possible for an undergraduate student with a second class upper to get straight into a PhD? Okay. This is not common for the applicants from from abroad. Here, uh, I'm currently teaching an undergrad an undergrad course, and within that undergrad course, if I pick uh, some good students. I will check with the university if this is possible. But we will not usually do this with people who are from outside the institution. It's not, it's not that easy. So I'm not aware of the policies. Uh, those policies could differ from an institution to another. So I knew uh, in one of the universities where I have been here in Canada, Th this was possible and i have seen people from under from undergrad yeah they have we call it the accelerated path yeah 
I have seen people who had who have gone through the accelerated path, but I'm not quite sure if this is this is there in all universities. So I advise Arnold to look at the to search to do a search in the university uh, about this. And I also, with regards to that, is also country specific. In Canada, is not really common, but in the US, like professors, you could actually do like even for international students to be okay. able to get a direct uh, application. But, so. but even in US, it, it I think up to up to my knowledge, it remains uh, a, a, a an institution specific. Specific, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it remains to the institution. It's not general for every institution institutions exactly agree with them and, and and sorry to add one thing and even for those institutions which enable you to go to accelerated pass but they ask you to 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 defend a master thesis somewhere in the middle so that okay yeah. if something happened then you can Once. quit you can quit the, the program with a master's on the on hand yeah that's that's true um, well, we are we are almost exceeded our time. Mm -hmm. So um, if you still have any questions, um, leave it in the comment section. If not, um, Dr. I said, do you have like a general advice and we could call it a day? I'm like, I'm saying uh, thank you very much. And this was a very um, informa informative session. Mm -hmm. I also learned a lot and I'm happy to have you here. So if you could give us like, a final advice if there are no questions and we could okay. today. Uh, the final advice is once your transcript, uh, mm -hmm. as we say, it is a what is a an investment. Your your application for graduate studies is an investment from day one in your undergrad. So having that in mind, once your transcript, you invested to make very good transcript. Yeah. Then when you are at the stage of writing. Of course, once we having the transcripts as well as the involvement in extracurricular activities, when you come to the writing, write with what can I say? Be mindful of how you write, and a writing piece that is written with full devotion and commitment to the to, 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 to crafting that story can be felt by the reader. You get the point, can be felt. There is something hidden, I don't know how can I explain it, but like when people talk to you from their heart, yeah. can reach you, exactly. When you put all what you have in your soul in that piece of document, it can read the reader. Yeah. There is, uh, I cannot say it scientifically how that can be proven, but it can be felt. And I. I Sorry, sorry to cut you short, but like I totally agree with you. Like even for me personally, like I always advise people that when you have your writing, read it. If you don't feel it, nobody else will feel it because if you, the writer, you are not feeling. Because like when I always read my statement, like I always ensure that I feel the words before I take it across. So if I'm not feeling it, I don't expect anybody to feel it. So I totally agree with you and I understand. That's true. If you are not excited about your writing, no one else will bother herself himself to be excited. So be ready to write compelling documents which can drive motivation, excitement to you first and then to the readers. Thank you. Thank you to this uh, few questions coming in. So, how many mails do you send to an unresponsive professor before you are sure it's not working between you two? I didn't get this question. Okay, so uh, there, there's a problem where students send a lot of mails to professors, but they don't get responses. So, like, they keep on sending emails, so they don't get responses. So, what he wants to know is that. What is the maximum number of times? Maybe you sent a first email, you didn't get a response after two weeks, you followed up. Then you follow up, like, how long should it be like, okay, no, like this mm. professor, maybe. I don't know. Uh, this is, this can be, this, I cannot give you a generic answer to this because it depends from professor to another. Uh, believe me, if the professors have to respond to all the emails they receive, I think they should shut up all the other research that they do. Yeah, believe me, every day I receive tons of emails for this. So 
But all of those emails, I keep them into one folder. I call it uh, graduate applicants. I keep them in one folder. And then there is a time that comes where I go, I go look at them one by one and then take them up to another level after scrutinizing them. So frankly, do not expect that you will receive uh, responses right away or for, and perhaps for some you, not, you may not uh, receive responses. In my case, I try uh, my best to respond uh, either positively or negatively because at the end, uh, every professor has a limited fund, he cannot, she, he cannot take all the students. So when it's not possible, we could simply say uh, it's not possible because we have limited funds. When it's possible, we can ask them to go for a second stage of online talking. So to make it short, what is common is that if you send an email or you send your documents in the beginning, and then after one day you follow up, after the second day you follow up, that becomes a bit hectic. So keep it, keep it like, the, the frequency of follow up should be a bit like distant. So keep some distance between the between the follow ups. That works. Okay. And um, I'm going to piggyback on that. Is there a, a particular period you think will be a great time for a student to send an email? Maybe you feel that maybe in October, in, because I know like the uh, choosing a student it depends on when you write a grant. So mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendation on specific months or periods where students should send these emails? Uh, students, especially if you send emails in between, like let us say from September to November, it's very tough. From September, yeah, the two months which are very tough for researchers in Canada are September and October because most of the application deadlines are at this time and they will be hectically working on submitting their grants. However, the other, I'm, I'm not talking generally. I'm talking, yeah, I agree, I'm, yeah. I'm talking, I'm not talking generally. Uh, I'm just most of the time here in Canada, the, this time, uh, there are a lot of deadlines for research uh, grant applications. So look at the applicant of the uh, deadline application, get deadlines for your, for the school you are applying to and, uh, try to have if you have inquiries, any questions, to have them well earlier, that will help. Yeah. As far as as we come closer to the deadlines, everything gets tightened, and uh, most likely you will not get response quickly from the professors. Okay. So personally, um, what period do you think will be good for you? Like, let's say maybe you prefer inquiries maybe from March to June if they want to get into the fall session. Like, what months are uh, but, uh, uh, that that has to be before September. Like, let us say during early early of the summer, beginning of the summer, that's the best time. Let us say from June to uh, August. June to August is the best time. Okay. Uh, I'm still trying to have most of what I want of my students during the winter, uh, the the fall. Okay. So to accept people in fall, I should do those selections from June, July, during this time. So if you want people in fall, which is in September, yeah. still for for, and for out, uh, still for a student abroad, I think even June is a bit late. Late, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think even it should be earlier than that, yeah. Okay. It should be like, let us say from uh, April, let's say from April, then we have around five months for it. Yeah, that, that works. Okay, okay. And a follow up question again. Um, could you um, explain in detail like how the funding works? Like, like let's say maybe you, you have to write a grant, like how does it work? Like if you have money to dish out, how does the whole process work? It also helps students to understand it a bit, a bit better because I feel that sometimes they feel that maybe you go collect the money from the tree. So like, how does it work? Yeah. Uh, first of all, when our session is ending, because I, I need to go I, I, yeah, when is the session is ending? Actually, we are supposed to have ended a long time ago. So, okay. like, how, how long do you have? But we okay. are almost done. We almost yeah, done. I, I have around uh, another 10 minutes, but let okay. us uh, make it shorter because yeah. I have to leave as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is something that students should understand. When, when the professor says she, he does not have funds, that's it, because without funding, the professor cannot hire a student. 
the professor before hiring a master student needs to have in her his research uh, account sufficient money for the total duration, not only for one year. If you are coming for uh, for five for four years PhD and every year costs us around twenty thousand dollars, so the professor must have at least eighty thousand dollars in his his her research account to bring you. So. And that money, the professor must write research grants, proposals to bring that money. And, and that's why when some professors respond to, prof to students that, and that's what I do uh, when I'm not able to, 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 to choose all those who apply, I just tell them that your CV is bright. And that's true. Many have very bright CVs, but um, unfortunately cannot take them because I don't have sufficient funds. And that's normal because uh, everyone is limited and we have funds, but that fund cannot, you cannot take all one village. So okay, yeah, that's true. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, it was, it was actually a great session. I like to say, uh, thank you very much. I will still like to bring you back again for us to maybe mm -hmm. discuss how to write a recommendation letter or like how to prepare a CV, but like, I also like to um to bring you back again hopefully you'll be able to accept to come back oh my god like say um, sometime later <laughs> yeah, not a rush yet, but sometime later. Um, having yeah yeah i'm glad to have uh like in uh spend this time with you and the our colleague our students our african bright talents and i hope to see some of you at mcmasters one day yeah that would be great um, and Thank you and um, um, have a good day. You so. too. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you all the audience.